Next up is Izzy Tween. Izzy works um, at the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust as the Beaver Recovery Project Officer. In this uh, role, she facilitates the Trust's aspiration to conduct a wild release of beavers on the Isle of Wight. Um, Izzy has five plus years of wildlife biology experience with a master's degree in environmental science and a bachelor's degree in zoology. With a deep understanding of the processes underlying conservation and ecology. Field work in various countries from the US to UK to Norway to Botswana has allowed her to study and protect diverse ecosystems and endangered species. Prior to her time at Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust, she was a fisheries technician, the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources. Uh, I am pleased to bring Izzy to the stage. Thank you for that introduction and thank you for inviting me. So my name is Izzy Tween and I work for the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust, which is a non-profit conservation charity that aims to restore biodiversity and wildlife in two counties in southern England. So for those of you whose geography may be a, a, a little blurry across the pond, uh, I have quite a lot of maps in this presentation. So the first map is of Britain here. So this is England. Uh, so we have Scotland to the north, Wales to the west. Everything else is England. And uh, the two counties that are highlighted are Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. So one of the ways in which Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust would like to restore wildlife and wetlands onto the Isle of Wight is by carrying out a beaver introduction. So what I would like to talk to you about today is uh, starting off with the comeback of beavers across Europe and Britain. We'll then talk about island beavers, where beavers are currently found and other islands that could potentially support beavers. We'll then talk specifically about the feasibility of a beaver release onto the Isle of Wight and we'll talk about the somewhat degraded baseline conditions that are found on the island and we'll talk about the benefits that beavers could bring. We'll then touch briefly on the management implications that are specific to an island release before finishing up with a conclusion and hopefully some time at the end for questions. So beavers are definitely making a comeback across Europe and they have encountered a dramatic expansion in range since their low point of falling to just 1,200 animals after centuries of hunting and overexploitation. So beavers were restricted to just a few isolated refugia and you can see those on the map colored in black. So some of those refugia include in Norway there, tiny little one in France there, in Germany on the Elbe River, and then a few more in Eastern Europe. But since that time, since the alleviation of hunting pressure, beavers have encountered a dramatic expansion in range, both through natural proliferation and also multiple translocation and reintroduction projects. And Britain is one such recipient of many of those translocations. And this map dating from 2020 shows some of the, of the introductions and translocations. And we'll be talking a little bit about the beavers up on the River Tay, and also down in the River Otter, just to give you some context. So, as many of you will probably know, beavers are doing very well in Scotland, mostly because of the illegal introduction of beavers onto the River Tay in Perthshire. And even just across the, the previous last 10 years, which is the difference in date between these two maps, beavers have been expanding in range. Uh, so we have the River Tay up here, uh, but this most recent survey carried out in 2021 has shown that beavers have expanded into the fourth river, which is actually down here. And that river flows through the city of Stirling and on through Edinburgh, uh, which is Scotland's capital. So populations of beavers in England and Wales are somewhat behind that of Scotland. Um, you will have seen that from Alicia's presentation yesterday. Um, but even still, over recent years, we are seeing a dramatic, some would say exponential increase in beaver introductions in England. And that is largely due to the success of the River Otter beaver trial. So that was a scientific study that was done on the wild population of beavers that was once again uh, illegally or unofficially uh, released into the River Otter in Devon. So that's circled there. So currently, we now have wild populations, all of which have um, escaped or been helped to escape their enclosures. So each of these green squares represents a wild population of beavers. So we have wild beavers in Devon, in Cornwall, in Kent, in Somerset and Wiltshire, and in Herefordshire as well. However, all of these beaver populations are found on mainland Britain, 
And as some of you may or may not know, the British Isles is composed of approximately 189 inhabited islands, and mainland Britain comprises just 66% of the land area. So other islands that comprise the British Isles include Ireland, the Inner and Outer Hebrides, the Northern Isles, including both Orkney and Shetland, the Isle of Man, the Farne Islands, Anglesey, Lundy, the Scilly Isles, and not least the Isle of Wight, which is England's largest island. So an important question to ask is whether we should introduce beavers onto some of these largest islands or whether they'll naturally colonize anyway. So to give you an understanding of how to answer this question, we first have to understand the arguments as to perhaps why you wouldn't want an island release. And there are a number of arguments as to why you may not want an island release of, of beavers, perhaps. So the first argument is that of playing God. The idea that the species wouldn't naturally recolonize on its own, and by translocating it, you are acting against nature. The next uh, argument that I come across is that of ecological purism. The idea that islands can have a unique and delicate ecology, perhaps with high levels of endemism, and that by introducing a species, you could disrupt this and threaten the presence of existing species. The next argument is that of size. Simply, the islands are too small, and there's just not enough space or suitable habitat to support an introduction. The next argument is that of history. Was the species ever present? And if so, why did it go extinct? And then finally, the last argument that I come across is that of genetics. The idea that a species would inbreed or would need artificial management through translocation in order to remain genetically healthy. So in order to address these, it is of course important to recognize that Britain as a whole is an island, which separated off from continental Europe about 8,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age with rising sea levels. And of course, we know that beavers are doing very well in Britain. They have expanded in range in all three home nations. They have been given leave to remain, and they have or will soon receive European protected species status. So when it comes to the island of Britain, at least, these arguments don't seem to pertain. And there are a number of other nations across the world where island beavers are doing very well. So Norway is one such nation, which is comprised of some 50,000 islands, and beavers are flourishing. Having never been eradicated, the population has grown from a handful of individuals to more than 80,000, and they are slowly colonizing the dissected fjordlands of the southwest, swimming through brackish and salt water as they do so. Estonia is another such nation where beavers are thriving and recolonizing islands. So to give you a bit of context, uh, Estonia is a Baltic state. Um, it is found west of Russia, south of Finland, and north of Latvia. So beavers have recolonized well, and they recorded a maximum population of beavers of some 20,000 animals back in 2010. Since then, beaver populations have fallen slightly due to increased rates of hunting. But even still, in this population census that was carried out in 2015 to 2016, we can see that beavers have recolonized a number of islands, including the two small islands of Muhu and Kinu, excuse my pronunciation, <laughs> and also the larger and more populated islands of Salama and Hiuma. Of course, when we're talking about island beavers, it's impossible to ignore uh, the fact that beavers are doing very well in the Tierra del Fuego, which is off the coast of Argentina and Chile. So beavers were introduced into Argentina in 1946 after 25 pairs were airdropped from Canada uh, down into Argentina for the fur trade. And although beavers are not native to the southern hemisphere and have done considerable damage to the native forests of the Notofagus Beach down there, so those beaches are slow growing, they don't coppice, and they're intolerant to flooding. Even despite that, beavers have nonetheless managed to expand their territory and thrive, with current population estimates running from 41 to 49,000. So beavers were dropped originally close to Ushuaia, and from there have, spled, have spread onto the island of Navarino, and from there they have spread westwards, colonizing the Dawson Island chain into Chile. And then this now brings us to Scotland. So we've already talked about the population of beavers that is thriving on the east coast in the Tayside, uh, but there was also an official Scottish beaver trial that took place where beavers were introduced on the west coast onto a peninsula called Napdale. And during that Scottish beaver trial, beavers were recorded to have swam a kilometer off stream onto the island of Shuna, where beaver foraging activity was recorded. So using the data from the very well-studied Tierra del Fuego population of beavers, 
the maximum size of the strait that beavers have found to have colonized is six kilometers, so that's four miles. So using that as a, perhaps a, a modeling baseline, a number of Scottish islands within that six kilometer or four mile distance have been predicted to support natural beaver colonization. So islands that are located within six kilometers of the Scottish mainland include Butte, Arran, Jura, Mull, and Sky. They're all colored green on that map. And then islands that are then located within six kilometers of those islands, they're colored dark blue here, then include Isla, Iona, and Rase. And that's to name just but a few. So that obviously begs the question, how wide is the Solent, the strait of water that separates the Isle of Wight from the English mainland? And could beavers naturally colonize? Well, probably. So the, the Solent, the strait that separates the Isle of Wight from, from England, varies in width along its 20 mile length. Um, but some of the shortest distances there are four kilometers, so well within that six kilometer range. And actually, you may be able to see uh, that peninsula there. So that's Hurst Spit, and that sticks well out into the Solent. And the minimum distance there is just 1.6 kilometers. So, okay then, how about the feasibility of introducing beavers onto the Isle of Wight? So University of Exeter hydrologists have done a series of modeling work looking at beaver habitat suitability based upon the BRAT model that many of you are probably familiar with, Joe Wheaton's work. So this is a map of the outcome of their habitat suitability modeling for the island. And you can see there, we've got all the rivers and they're split up into chunks and they're color coded according to their suitability to support beavers. And that's based on the availability of forage within 100 meters of the water's edge. So hopefully you can see the colors there. Uh, the yellow color indicates preferred habitat. So that's areas of deciduous woodland that are located within 100 meters of the water's edge. As we move through the color spectrum there, we then go from yellow into green, so that still represents high quality, suitable habitat. Um, so that's representing areas of marshland and scrub. From there, we move into the blues. So those are moving more into perhaps the coniferous woodland, uh, the grasslands, the reed beds, and all of those would support beavers. Uh, the unsuitable habitat there is characterized as gray, and that is saline environments or, or hard bare rock, sand, shingle beaches, things like that. So you can see that there's a really good amount of suitable habitat, particularly in the east of the island. Uh, so that's our longest river there. That's the Eastern Yar. And that is 24 kilometers long or 15 miles. So that's where probably the majority of beavers would thrive and do well. We've also got really good habitat in the Medina River above its saline estuary. Um, there's also some really good freshwater tributaries that go into the estuaries of Newtown Creek and the Western Yar. Then there's a number of other smaller streams on the north coast. So a feasibility study was conducted um, by some familiar names um, in 2020, and the results of that feasibility study indicated that the entire catchment, including the proposed release site, is highly suitable for beaver release and long-term occupation. And the release site in question is pictured here. So it's New Church Moors Nature Reserve. It's owned and managed by Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust. And it's, as you can see, pretty ideal. We've got existing deep water there. So this area used to be extracted for peat. So all of those peat extraction pits are now filled with deep water. And it's obviously surrounded by lots of riparian scrub, including willow, birch, and alder. So another really great aspect of the Eastern Yar River is the large amount of land that's held in tenure for conservation management. So Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust own 4.5 kilometers of the river channel, 300 acres of floodplain, and then below that in the estuary of the Eastern Yar, the RSPB conservation charity own a further 1,150 acres along 3.5 kilometers of the river. So that leads up to eight kilometers of the river being held in conservation management. So the Isle of Wight is actually already a haven for a number of species um, that are really important for supporting a wildlife tourism economy. So those include small mammals, including red squirrels, which is our native red, which elsewhere on the British mainland has been outcompeted by the North American grey. So there's also very good populations of dormice um, and water voles as well due to the absence of North American mink. Not blaming you guys here, <laughs> there is definitely a trend. <laughs> and it's also actually been the site of a successful white-tailed eagle introduction, so our equivalent of the bald eagle. And as a result of this, um, the island has been des designated as a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve in 2019. 
So there are obviously a number of benefits that beavers can bring, which I'm sure we're very all well acquainted with. Um, and increasing urbanization and industrialized agriculture on the island have led to three major hydrological issues. The first of which is stretched water resources. So abstraction for public water supply, agriculture and industry have all led to um, supply increasing and exceeding demand. And this is a map showing all the abstraction wells, both surface and groundwater across the island. And water is actually now piped underneath the Solent um, across from Hampshire in order to help mitigate this. But of course, as we all know, beavers with their damming activities can increase groundwater infiltration and aquifer recharge um, and help support our water supply by buffering water availability during dry summer months. The next issue that we're seeing is that of moderate water quality. So we're seeing um, inputs from runoff from urban areas and also agricultural pollution. And below particular point sources, such as sewage treatment works, we're seeing ratings of poor in certain places. And as a result of industrialized and intensive agriculture, much of the island is designated as a nitrate vulnerable zone. However, as we know, beavers are very good at improving water quality and studies from Devon have shown that beaver dams are very effective at filtering out silt and sediment and also anything else that is chemically bound to that silt and sediment. So that includes both nitrates and phosphates. So the final major issue that we see on the island is the increased risk of flash flooding and that is as a result of increasing surface water runoff and also due to increasing frequency of more extreme rainfall events. Um, However, this has been exacerbated by the fact that the Eastern Yar River has been channelized. And this basically means that it is a very effective transport corridor for water. And every time it rains, we get a huge flashy uh, system. A lot of surface water flows into the river. It is conducted very rapidly downstream. But we have a series of bridges and infrastructure with culverts. And at such a point, all of that water cannot possibly flow through such a constriction. And the river bursts its banks. So we see that particularly well here on this photo. So this is a photo of the Eastern Yard taken over the estuary. And you can see the straightened channel, uh, absolutely artificially straight as a die. You can see uh, the original pathway of the river, these meanders that are disconnected and no longer functioning. And the river has also been dredged over many years. And as the excavators have gone along the river, they've dug out all the spoil and they've just perched it on the side. So you can actually see these raised banks of all that dredged spoil material, which further decreases the connectivity of the river to the floodplain. So as a result, whenever it rains, we get water cascading off from the rest of the island, flowing very rapidly downstream. But we have obviously some infrastructure here. So in this case, we have a sluice gate here under this road, and the water can burst its banks at this point, but at a point of key infrastructure, uh, where we have roads and even people's houses. So obviously, it makes sense if we can slow the flow and store more of this water on the floodplain upstream and alleviate some of the pressure on these downstream communities. And what a surprise, we know that beavers can do this because beaver dams can slow the flow. And as we see from this hydrograph, after heavy rainfall events downstream of beaver establishments, we see a much slower response to heavy rainfall with a much more shallower gradient. We see lower peak flows and we see that the water is held on the landscape for longer and trickles slowly through those dams. And so we get more water held for longer, um, which basically decreases that pressure on our downstream communities. So this study has actually been repeated in four other locations across England. And in every single one of those case studies, we see similar results where beavers have decreased the, the maximum flow. So we've got this decrease here. So this red line represents um, before beavers were present. This blue line represents after beavers were introduced and have built dams. And we see significant reductions in flow in every single one of these sites. So we also know that beavers are, are pretty popular amongst the general public due to their cute and fluffy, furry, little charismatic personalities. And in Devon, we saw a significant demonstrable increase in visitors of people flocking from miles around to come and see beavers in their establishments. And local businesses reported increased custom uh, with increased forest, tourist footfall, um, especially for those that capitalized on the presence of beavers and uh, brought out some beaver themed marketing. And there are a number of businesses within the Eastern Yard catchment uh, that could similarly benefit from, from increased tourist footfall, including uh, some of these pictured here, the Garlic Farm and Peddler's Cafe. So that's not to mention the obvious massive um, importance to biodiversity that we could see. Um, so this, uh, we have a number of, of species on the island that could really benefit from the introduction of beavers. So that could range from our macroinvertebrate populations, which in turn would support our foraging birds and bats. Our amphibian populations would benefit from increased spawning habitat in more standing water. 
our water voles would benefit from increased wetted edge habitat and also beaver coppicing behavior, where beavers could coppice over hanging willow and let more light into the river corridor and create these wonderful grazing lawns that water voles need to forage. Obviously, more standing water could be very beneficial for our wading bird populations and for our trout. So trout could benefit, obviously, for a number of reasons, from more water available through our dry summer months, from more thermal refuges, from more woody debris, allowing more cover in the water system to evade predation, and obviously, uh, increased macroinvertebrate production would allow more prey. And then once we start seeing increases in our fish, uh, obviously that then supports up the food chain for our predators, including our otters, which would benefit not only from increased fish populations, but also more abundance of burrows available for halts. So obviously beavers would need management, the same as in any other catchment, and these would range um, within their sort of hierarchical approach, I suppose, starting with education and outreach, um, and some tree protection, some dam manipulation, the use of uh, so-called beaver deceivers and pond levelers, and also live trapping and translocation, perhaps. And this last could potentially be particularly important for an island population, given that immigration and emigration may be difficult. We are therefore pursuing a partnership with the Wild Heart Animal Sanctuary, who we hope may build us a holding facility on site. So that could be really important for rehabilitation of sick or injured animals, but it also could potentially serve as a launch pad for translocation on and off the island to maintain genetic diversity. So in conclusion, would we be playing God if beavers were released onto the island? Well, probably not, since eventually beavers could eventually colonize anyway. Yes, the island does have some rare species, such as red squirrels that have managed to survive in the absence of greys, but these are unlikely to be negatively impacted by a beaver release. And when you consider all the other wildlife on the island that would likely thrive, the biodiversity argument really is a no-brainer. Is the island too small? Well, there certainly is plenty of suitable habitat, and the feasibility definitely supports a release. Not to mention all the land held in conservation within the catchment by the Wildlife Trust and the RSPB. As to whether beavers were ever present on the island, they certainly were. The Isle of Wight only separated from mainland Britain at the end of the last ice age, about 8,000 years ago, long after beavers first evolved and colonised. They likely went extinct soon after the separation of the island from the mainland, and we don't have any archaeological evidence of beavers dating after that time. However, beavers likely went extinct because of hunting pressure, which has since been alleviated, especially with beavers becoming a European protected species status. And as for inbreeding, well, perhaps that could become a problem if the population was left unmanaged. But beavers are already translocated in certain catchments all over the world for conflict resolution, as well as for genetic management. And many of the isolated founder populations in Britain are already suffering from a decreased genetic diversity. Many of these populations are pretty undiverse because they've been illegal uh, escapees and they've stemmed from just a few, maybe even just a couple of beavers. And so translocation is likely to be very necessary and is probably going to be a major component of our government's uh, national management strategy because we're not getting much genetic input from our isolated population. So translocation between catchments, say between Devon and Kent, is likely to feature highly. And if the Isle of Wight could develop a great genetically diverse population of beavers through various um, inputs of genetic material um, from different catchments and different populations to start with, as we reach carrying capacity, potentially other projects may welcome further genetic input from some of these down the line. So in conclusion, Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust are looking to release beavers to enhance biodiversity, deliver ecosystem services, and enhance our climate resilience for islanders for many years to come. Many thanks for listening. Are there any questions? Well done, Izzy. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, whirlwind tour and so well, well articulated. Um, I'm really curious about the saline influence. I, I just hear about beavers in the Elwha off of Washington's coast, and I just I haven't looked that much into it. And I'm sure you have a lot of information. Um, I'd love to hear like how that might influence part of this. 
Yeah, actually, there's not a huge amount of information about beavers' tolerance to salinity, and those um, papers that you mentioned coming from uh, Western Washington and like the Puget Sound is, is the major source of that information. Um, so beavers' tolerance to salt water is not particularly well studied, um, but obviously we do know that beavers are, are freshwater animals, and in certain conditions they can be overcome by salt water and their kidneys can fail, uh, which gives them what's called salt sickness. And certainly in the rest of Britain, we are seeing... Uh, uh, beavers, particularly, you know, dispersing two-year-olds that are deciding to swim downstream and are ending up in estuaries and either dying or, or needing rehabilitation. Um, so we think... Uh that it will be very interesting for us to be able to study this. And this, I think, is going to be, uh, if, if this um, release goes ahead, if we are successful with our license application, certainly could provide a lot more information on this. You will have seen from some of that modelling that I showed earlier that huge swathes of our rivers are modelled as unsuitable due to the saline influence. But yet we know that beavers are thriving in estuarine environments in the Puget Sound. And so perhaps the habitat suitability on the island could be a lot larger, uh, depending, I suppose, perhaps on individual tolerance of salt water. So in terms of, of management of that, uh, we are working quite closely with our, our estuaries officer um, as we anticipate that as uh, our population grows and expands, we will see increasing colonization into those sort of salty environments and perhaps that could lead to a need for rehabilitation and we think that that's going to be perhaps a major role for that facility that we are working with the Wild Heart Animal Sanctuary. That was a great presentation. My, my nieces live in London and Edinburgh, and I'm always texting them beaver information about what's going on in Great Britain. So you mentioned that the water is already pretty deep um, on the aisle. Is there any concern that they won't build dams if the water is deep enough already, and then you won't get the ecosystem services from the dams? Yeah, so that's a really important point, and I'm going to go back. Oh, let's stay there. Um, so that picture of the release site I showed you is has been identified as a perfect release site because it already has deep water and so it would be you know a great soft release because beavers actually wouldn't have to dam particularly in that area. So that's an off-channel pond, it's just a peat extraction pit, but it has an outflow and that flows into the major river of the Eastern Yar. The rest of our rivers uh, really aren't like that, so that's kind of an anomaly from human impact. The rest of the rivers um, are, I guess pretty shallow. You can see the size of the catchment. I mean, to give you some context, the whole of the island is just 26 miles wide. I've walked it in a day. <laughs> so it's small catchments and not a huge amount of flow. Um, I haven't shown the dam capacity modeling in this presentation. You probably would have been interested to see it. Um, but the main river, Eastern Yar, is a fifth order stream. And so below the confluence of the Upper Eastern Yar and the Roxall Stream, the dam capacity modelling actually anticipates a relatively rare likelihood of damming along the main river. But um, above that confluence and all the headwater streams that come in, there's actually a really high likelihood of damming in those smaller headwater streams where obviously the stream power would be less. So perhaps there would be relatively little damming uh, further down in the main catchment, but we would anticipate a lot of, of um, damming in the upper catchment, which I think would deliver a lot of benefit in terms of capturing some of that rainfall. So what's the actual holdup? Sorry? What's the actual holdup? Why aren't <laughs> they already released? intense bureaucratic red tape. <laughs> Any of you that may have seen Alicia's presentation yesterday uh, are going to be aware that this has been a really long process of getting beavers back into Britain. The fact that Britain is an island gives us a lot of control about playing God, about whether species should be introduced or not. Um, and there's, there's just an enormous amount of, of risk assessment. Um, the I guess the disease, the fox tapeworm, that some of you may be aware of that beavers can carry um, is prevalent across Europe and there's actually a moratorium. There's, it's absolutely forbidden to import beavers from mainland Europe right now because of the, the risk of, of that disease being transferred onto the island. So that's one aspect. Another aspect is the, the government is sort of creating a management strategy. They're doing a huge amount of consultation. They're trying to placate various stakeholders, including both farmers and anglers that have perhaps more diverse opinions about beavers that are found within this room. Um, so they're just taking it really slow. They're trying to do things right. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of the beavers that were already found wild in England are illegal releases. Um, none of them have followed the IUCN guidelines of, of how to do a release right. And the government is recognizing that to be successful, a lot of stakeholder engagement and getting people on board is necessary to avoid persecution. I don't know if many of you are aware, but there is a huge amount of persecution going on in Scotland along the Tay catchment, and hundreds of beavers are shot there every year. And there is a lot of live trapping 
everything that goes on to try and eradicate that pressure. But in the taste side, that area of Perthshire, that's kind of like the breadbasket of Scotland, and there's a lot of really productive agricultural land in that floodplain. So the government is really keen to try and avoid any other such situations where beavers may be introduced and suffer really high levels of persecution. So they have a very thorough and robust license application process, which they are currently developing, which involves a lot of stakeholder um, engagement and risk assessment and, and everything else. And that's what I spend a lot of my time dealing with. <laughs> Thank you, Izzy. Thank you.